It was close on three when the knock came in the night. She was out of bed on the instant in her old flannelette nightgown, with her silver-gray hair tossed down her back. The nightlight was flickering quietly, as in the shadows by the elm tree outside she discerned Manahan's unshaven face under the battered hat. "'The pain is bad on the girl,' came his voice. "'I think maybe it's surely her time.' "'Go before me fast and have plenty of hot water,' she answered. "'I'll be at your heels with Frank.' She heard his foot in the night hurrying off as she drew on her heavy dress over the nightgown, himself stirred and put his beard irascibly outside the blankets. "'You'll go none,' he snapped. "'A slut like that. "'That gets her child outside of priest and law, four miles uphill on a mountain road, and the mists a swarming. I'll go, she said quietly, and crossing, she ruffled Frank's unruly hair on the little camp bed. Be rising, Frank, and let you carry the lantern for me to Manahan's. If there was just a drop of tea before we start, Ma, he protested sleepily. There's no time, son. A grand pass we've come to in this country, grumbled himself, encouraging the hussies and the sluts to be shameless. I'd let her suffer. A good belly full of suffering would keep her from doing it again. He moved coughingly into the deep, warm hollow she had vacated in the bed. The strictures of his uncharitable piety followed her into the silver and ebony of the mountainy night. She went gently, her feet almost noiseless. There was an inward grace in her that spilt out and over her physical lineaments lending them to a strange lightness and beauty of movement. Frank was a little ahead of her, swinging the storm lantern. He was munching a currant scone plastered with butter. His sturdy little legs took the steep, sharp, pebbled incline with careless grace. Now and again, he mannishly kicked a stone from his path and whistled in the dark. "'Careful now, Frank, in case you'd slip over the bank in the dark,' she admonished. "'Ach, ma!' The way you talk, you'd think I wasn't grew up. It makes little of a fella. She smiled and watched him lovingly in the silver dark. He was her youngest. The others had all followed the swallows into the mighty world. Martin was in America, Annie in England, Matthew in Glasgow, Patty in the Navy, Mary Kate a nursemaid in Canada. Michael was at rest, somewhere in Italy. His CO had said in a letter that he had died well. If that meant that he had had a priest in his last hours, then God be praised, for he was her wayward one. She preferred him dying full of grace to dying full of glory. But Frank was still with her. He had her eyes and gentleness and the winning tilt of the head. It would be good to have him close to her, her weary eyes at the end of all. They had now crossed the cockeyed little bridge over a dashing, tawny stream, and the mountains came near her and about her like mighty elephants gathered in a mystic circle for some high purpose. Everywhere in the vast silvery empire of the dark there was the deep silence of the eternal, except for the rebellious chattering of the mountain streams racing with madcap abandon to the lock below. There were the infant terrible of the mighty house, keeping it awake and uneasy. Now and again a cottage lifted a sleepy eye out of its feathery thatch, smiled at her knowingly, and slumbered again. All of them knew her, knew of her heroism, her quiet, skilled hands, her chiding, coaxing voice in the moments of peril. In each of them she had been the leading actress in the great primitive drama of birth. The climb was now grueling, and Frank took her on pantingly. The lantern threw its yellow ray merrily ahead. All would be well. She ruffled his hair playfully and smiled secretively under the black mask of the night. At a mischievous bend on the mountain path, the Manahan cottage suddenly jumped out of the mist like a sheepdog and welcomed them with a blaze of wild flowering creepers. Inside, the middle-aged laborer was bending over a dark, deep chimney nook. A turf fire burned underneath on the floor. From a sooty hook far up, a rude chain hung down and supported a large pot of boiling water. 
She nodded approvingly, and donning her overalls, moved away in the direction of the highly pitched cries from an inner room. If there's anything I can do, he called, half shyly, after her. Keep a saucepan of gruel, thin and hot, she answered, and put the bottle of olive oil on the hob in case we'll need it. Play about, Frank, and behave yourself till I call you. She went smiling to the bed and looked down on the flushed, tearful face, the big bloodshot eyes, and the glossy, tossed hair of the girl. No more than eighteen, she thought, but a well-developed little lass with a full, luscious mouth and firm, shapely breasts. Jim Cleary, who skipped to England in time, had had a conquest worth his while. That little rebel, caught in the ruthless trap of nature, grabbed her hands beseechingly, held on to them hysterically, and yelled, "'Oh, Maura, ma'am, please, please, please!' she sobbed. Maura chafed her hands, soothed her gently, clacked her tongue admonishingly, and pretended to be very disappointed at her behavior. "'Now, now, now, Sadie,' she reproved her. "'A fine soldier you are. "'When I was here at your coming, your mother, God rest her, "'bit her lip hard and said no word at all. "'Come on now and be your mother's daughter.' "'Ah, sure, how can I be like me poor dead mother "'and me like this and all again me?' sobbed Sadie. "'Am I again ye, child?' soothed Mara. "'And I, after walking four miles of darkness to be with ye?' "'The tears came now, but silently, "'as Mora's skillful hands warmed to her work. "'Frank remained in the kitchen, at a loss, "'until suddenly the door opened "'and a large nanny goat sailed in with perfect equanimity "'and balefully contemplated this stranger on home ground. "'Frank looked askance at her full-length beard "'and her formidable pair of horns.' But this was one small consequence to the goat, which advanced on Frank, and in the wink of an eye had whipped his handkerchief out of his top pocket and stuffed it in her mouth. Frank's protest brought an assurance from Manahan, who was stooped over the fire, bringing the gruel to the boil. "'She'll not touch you,' he said without turning his head. "'But she has me handkerchief,' protested Frank. "'Ah, sure, isn't she only playing with you?' returned Manahan heedlessly. But by this time the goat had consumed the handkerchief with terrific relish and was about to make a direct attack on the sleeve of his jersey. Frank dashed for the door with the goat after him. In the little yard he dived behind the water barrel that caught all the rainwater from the roof. The goat snuffed him past in the darkness and Frank hastily retraced his steps to the kitchen and barred the door. He was just in time to see his mother put a generous spoonful of butter into a bowl of thin, steaming gruel. "'Go in and feed this to your daughter and coax her to take it,' she directed Manahan. "'She's quiet and easy now, and all will be well.' He obeyed her shyly and without a word. "'You must be a big grown-up fella tonight and help your ma, Frank,' she said. "'Anything you say, ma, what is it?' The baby had come forth without a cry. It was limp and devoid of any sign of life. She carried it quickly but calmly to the open peat fire, as close to the grimy chain as the heat would allow. It was naked and upside down. Frank, under her calm directions, held it firmly by its miniature ankles. "'Be a good son now, and don't let it fall,' she warned him, and plastering her own hands with the warm olive oil, she started to work methodically on the tiny body, up and down and across the little chest, lungs, buttocks, went the skillful fingers, rhythmically until the newborn skin glistened like a silver-wrought piece of gossamer. The long minutes went by heavily. The oil lamp flickered and went out leaving the dancing rays and shadow of fire to light this crude drama with its eternal theme. Five minutes, seven, ten, without fruit or the promise of fruit. By the moving fingers went on with rhythmic ruthlessness, searching for the spark that must surely be hidden there in a fold of the descending darkness. Frank's face was flushed, 
his eyes gathered up with the pain of exertion, his breath coming in spasms. On his mother's forehead, beads of sweat gathered, rivuleted down the gray, gentle face, and flowed on to the newborn baby body to be ruthlessly merged in the hot, oily waves of her massaging. Then suddenly, as the tension had reached almost to the unbearable, a thin, highly pitched cry came from the tiny spume-filled lips. She seized the baby, pushed Frank from her, turned it upright, grabbed a chipped, handleless cup of cold water, and even as the fluttering life hesitated on the miniature features for the one solitary second to receive its divine passport and the symbol of its eternal heritage, she poured a little of the water on the tiny skull and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. She wrapped the little corpse in the remnant of a torn sheet, without tear or trace of any sentiment, placed it in a drawer, and she took from the crazy wardrobe. Having made the sign of the cross over it, she gave it no further attention. When she saw that the bowl was almost empty of gruel, she chased Manahan out with a gesture and settled the little mother comfortably. She was adjusting her wet, tear-stained hair over her pillow when suddenly she felt Sadie's arms tightly about her neck. Her big eyes were quiet now, and the pain and the travail were gone, but the tears came rushing from them again as Maura kissed and soothed her. "'I wish I had me mother,' sobbed. "'Maura, ma'am, I'm going. I'm going to be a good girl from now on.' "'You have never been a bad one, darling,' coaxed Maura, tucking her faded bedclothes into her back. "'A wee bit foolish, maybe, but the world—' and the years will learn ye. Sleep now, and I'll see you tonight. She redonned her old black coat in the kitchen. I'll tell Maloney to bring you up a white box, she told Manahan. It'll save you the journey down. On the mountain path, she went noiselessly with Frank a little ahead, carrying the extinguished lantern. The dawn greeted her from the heights with far-flung banners of amber and amethyst. The heights themselves ceased from their eternal brooding for a brief moment of time and gave her a series of benign obeyances. The racing rivulets tossed her name from one to the other on the Lord's commendation. The sun himself, new risen and generous, sent a very special ray of light that caught up her tossed hair and rolled it in priceless silver. Why do men lie prone in their beds, she murmured, when the great glory of God's washing the hills with holy fire? Seamus Dunn was taking in his two nanny goats for the milking as she, she passed his cottage. The blessing of God light on ye, woman, he said, touching his windswept hat. And on yourself too, Seamus, she answered. How is the little fella now? Ah, oh, sure, he isn't over a stone weight already. Ah, woman, oh, wasn't it near thing that night? Ah, sure, only for yourself. Wasn't me whole world lost? Ah, men always think the worst at such times, she answered smilingly. Sure, there was never any great fear of the worst that night. Herself within is too much a good soldier for that. Frank had now discovered a salmon tin and was kicking it vigorously before him. She took out her rosary at the bend where the path dips perilously between two ageless boulders. And as she trudged along, she began counting the beads effortlessly. There on the heights at dawn, caught between the gold and the deepening blue of the day, she might have been a pilgrim out of a European that had long since vanished, or maybe a Ruth, garnering the lost and discredited straws of the age-old Christian thought. Frank had now lobbed his salmon tin on the lofty fork of a tree, and when she caught up with him, he took her arm undemonstratively. Himself would be up now, she thought, with his braces hanging and maybe a hole in his sock that she had overlooked. He wouldn't be able to find the soap and the towel even if they were both staring at him, and of course... If he blew the fire, even with a thousand breaths, it would never light for him. 
but no matter now. Thanks be to God, there was an egg left in the cracked bowl that would do for his breakfast. If the little white pullet in the barn laid in the old butter box, Frank would have one too, with the help of God. When the cock himself laid an egg, glory be, she'd get one all to herself. They crossed the rickety bridge as the dawn was losing its virgin color. Frank saw a squirrel and rushed ahead of her. She paused for a moment and contemplated the relentless waters. They took her like a rich tawny wine, poured out of some capacious barrel by some high, ruthless hand who had suddenly discovered the futility of all riches. A May Blossom rushed under the incongruous arch and emerged to get caught between a moss-covered stone and a jagged piece of rock. There was a turmoil and pain, and for a moment, and then when it freed itself, it rushed on. She wondered if it was like the little soul she had lately saved, rushing on in a virgin panic to the eternal waters. Maybe it was. Maybe she was just an imaginative old fool. Ah, sure, what harm anyway to be guessing at infinite mysteries, and she so small on a mountain road. Himself met her in the stone-floored kitchen. Indeed, yes, he was trailing his braces, and the sulky flyer was just given a last gasp before expiring. "'I suppose you saved the sluts, bastard,' he commented acidly. She bent on knees to blow the fire flame again. "'I saved him,' she said, and with a flame leapt suddenly upwards and made a sweet, unforgettable picture of her face." It was close on three when the knock came in the night. She was out of bed on the instant in her old flannelette nightgown, with her silver-gray hair tossed down.